from epidemiological data, that's the kind of data that can show associations but not causation, and it's just a notoriously unreliable kind of data. It's not supposed to be used for proving things. It's supposed to be used to kind of suggest hypotheses that then rigorous scientists go out and test. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 166. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our show features Nina Teicholz, an investigative journalist and author of the International and New York Times bestselling book, The Big Fat Surprise. Her book has upended the conventional wisdom on dietary fat and challenged the very core of our nutrition policy. Yeah, this is such a controversial book. The subtitle is actually Why Butter, Meat, and Cheese Belong in a Healthy Diet. So much science, great information. It's definitely going to get you thinking. Yeah, and this interview couldn't have come at a better time with all the controversy online around fat right now. This is a great interview, and we're so excited to share these points with you. So here's what we talk about today. The truth about coconut oil clearing up the controversy. It's probably a mistake for all of us to eat a Mediterranean diet. Saturated fats increase your HDL, the good cholesterol. Children do better on a high-fat diet. And 96% of the claims made in the documentary, What the Health, are based on weak to non-existent data. So much great information. I hope you guys are just as excited as I am. Here we go with Nina Teicholz. Hello, Nina. Welcome to the podcast. How's it going today? Hi. It's nice to be here. Well, we're excited to have you on the show. And we've got lots of good things to get into. Fat is, is definitely the topic today. But let's start off with what got you interested in this controversial world of especially saturated fat. How did you get started in this? Well, you know, I really didn't start off thinking I would write a book about saturated fat. I actually got a book contract to write about trans fats because I'd been assigned this article by Gourmet Magazine and discovered this whole world about trans fats. That magazine article got a ton of attention. I was offered a book contract. I was like, sure, I'll write a book about trans fats. And then when I started researching this whole world of dietary fat, I just realized it was a much bigger story. You know, dietary fat is what our nutrition recommendations and therefore all of us have most obsessed about, right? You know, good fat, bad fat, non-fat, low fat, what kind of fat? And I just realized that it was, we had gotten it totally upside down and backwards. So then I switched my book to be about all fats. And then it it wasn't even until like the last final editing bit when working with my editor and she's like, you know what, this is really a book about saturated fats. I was like, oh yeah, you're right. So we sort of then focused on saturated fats, but it was really an evolution. I mean, it wasn't like planned to write an extremely controversial book about saturated fats, but that's what I ended up doing. So let's start with that. Let's talk about maybe why saturated fat needs to be addressed in a different light. So these are the kinds of fats that are found predominantly in animal foods, meat and cheese and a little bit in eggs, but also coconut oil and palm oil are really high in saturated fats. And everybody needs to understand that like almost all foods are a combination of different kinds of fat. You know, like a piece of porterhouse steak is actually a third saturated fats too. You know, and another third is the kind of fat you find in olive oil. So it's not like this clear cut picture, but the idea that these fats, saturated fats, are bad for health goes back to the 1950s when in the US there was a real panic about the rising tide of heart disease that had come from pretty much out of nowhere in the 1920s, very rare to becoming the nation's number one killer. And President Eisenhower himself had a heart attack in 1955, was out of the Oval Office for 10 days. So like everybody was in just a panic about well, what causes heart disease. And there were a number of theories, you know, maybe it was auto exhaust, or maybe it was vitamin deficiency. I mean, there were prominent scientists promoting those ideas. But there was one scientist named Ansel Keys, who was a pathologist at the University of Minnesota. And it was really his idea that it was saturated fats and cholesterol, dietary cholesterol that were causing heart disease. That's where this all started. And he was this aggressive personality, really like an he had uh, an unshakable faith in his own beliefs. And he was a very powerful man. And he was able to get his idea implanted into the American Heart Association in 1961. So really, the very first advice anywhere in the world telling people to cut back on saturated fat and cholesterol, and therefore animal foods mostly, was published by the American Heart Association in 1961. Like that's where it all began. So 
you know, what my book explores is like, well, what was the evidence at the time? It was incredibly weak. It was based on, you know, what we call epidemiological study, but, you know, just a study that shows association, but not causation. You know, it was weak science from the start. And my book really tells the story about how it never got any stronger. <laughs> Let's dig into fats in the food industry. And before this time, when these studies came out, Ansel Keys, when he got out there and started promoting this new theory, what kind of fats were being used in foods before this time? So that's a great question because, you know, we've all forgotten that, you know, before 1900, really, it was butter and lard were pretty much the only fats that Americans cooked with, right? And that's true worldwide. I mean, lard, the ancient fat used by the Greeks, they didn't use olive oil, actually. They used olive oil to, to, as a cosmetic to make their muscles shine, but they didn't eat it. They cooked with lard, and that's true throughout European history, butter and lard. And then in the early 1900s, there was a chemist figured out, oh, if we squeeze out, at that time it was cotton seeds, we can extract oil from cotton seeds, and then we can make vegetable oils from cotton seeds, sunflowers, seeds, and then now the main oil comes from soybeans. But vegetable oils really didn't even come into existence as a foodstuff until, you know, the 19 teens. So actually, in the 1950s, what was going on? Vegetable oils, the rise in the consumption of vegetable oils was perfectly correlated with the rise in heart disease, right? They had come from zero to, you know, becoming more and more used. We had a product called Crisco, which was supposed to replace lard, you know, successfully did that. And then margarine replaced butter. Margarine is also just vegetable oils that have been hardened. So we went from, I mean, and this is true, we started in the US, but then spread all over the world. We went from being countries that mainly used animal fats to cook with and eat to using vegetable fats. The idea that was sold to us by the food industry was you have to use these newly invented vegetable fats to cure heart disease or to prevent heart disease. Was this during the Ansel Keys time that this change happened? The fear because saturated fats and cholesterol started being feared and, and then we started using vegetable oils? Or it sounds like it actually happened before that, but why the shift? Well, so Ansel Keys' idea was that saturated fats and cholesterol would raise your serum cholesterol. That's you know, the number you get back from your doctor, clog your arteries and cause a heart attack. And the idea was vegetable oils would reduce your blood cholesterol and therefore prevent a heart attack. It was really just speculation and very simplistic thinking. But the vegetable oils companies were basically able to get this group of scientists to promote this theory that vegetable oils would prevent heart disease. And they were involved in funding the science and you know, providing their products to do the science. And, you know, I'm not saying that Ansel Keys was bought off by these companies, but there was this kind of convergence of like passionate scientists who truly believe that saturated fats were bad and this incredible influence of all these vegetable oil companies like Procter & Gamble, the maker of Crisco Oil. These companies were able to get a, these scientists to buy the idea that recently invented vegetable oils could reduce your cholesterol and therefore prevent a heart attack. Even though, just to repeat, heart disease appeared at the same time that vegetable oils were invented. You know, the idea that vegetable oils would prevent heart disease was just completely contradicted by the evidence. It's still contradicted by the evidence. But, you know, nobody really looked at that data and the, the whole idea really took off. And we really have not retreated from it since. So we began using vegetable oils over a period of time. Then we discovered that when they were cooked and, and treated in certain ways in food processing, that we were creating trans fats. And again, this ties back to your story when you were actually hired to dig into trans fats. And as a journalist back early on in your uh, fat career. So let's talk about that. When did we start learning about these trans fats? And what did that mean? Yeah. So when I started, so it took me like almost a decade to research my book. And in the first couple of years, all I did was talk to vegetable oil scientists, because of course, at that point, I was thinking I'm writing a book about trans fats. So I talked to, you know, hundreds of people who do nothing but study vegetable oils. Okay. So the thing to understand is that when you make a vegetable oil, when you press it from cotton seed or soybean or sunflower seed, those oils are totally unstable. What does it mean to be unstable? Well, it means that you have a lot of, there's a lot of double bonds in the molecules. That's why they're called polyunsaturated fats. Poly means many. Every single one of those double bonds can react and bond with an oxygen. 
That's called oxidation. That's that thing that happens. That's why you eat or take antioxidants because oxidation is what happens that that causes massive inflammation in your body. It's a bad thing. And so these vegetable oils were highly oxidizable. It means they were totally unstable. And especially when you heat them, when you heat them, you know, heat, as you know, from your chemistry class and wherever you're in high school or wherever, it's like, if you heat something, the reaction speeds up. So if you're cooking with a vegetable oil, that oxidation is happening faster and faster. And that means your oils are getting more and more degraded and more, more likely to cause inflammation in your body. So in order to solve that problem, the vegetable oil industry From their perspective, oxidation means that products go rancid on shelves. They can't last on shelves because the oils just degrade, right? So they can't use them in food processing. And the way they solved that was they figured out this process called hydrogenation. They add hydrogen to the oil and it hardens the oil. It makes it hard and stable. And that means they can put it in their products that'll last long on the shelf. And, you know, you probably saw this in a bunch of packages on food, hydrogenated soybean oil. And that basically mimics what lard and butter and they're hard fats, right? They're hard and that means they're stable. They can't oxidize. So the problem with hydrogenation, as scientists started to discover in the ninth, really in the 1970s, was one of the byproducts of hydrogenation is trans fats. When you hydrogenate an oil, you send it through this elaborate chemistry reaction and it creates all these new fatty acids. One of them is trans fats. And it was started to be discovered that trans fats seem to have a really bad effect on health. It hardens your each and every cell membrane. It messes up with, you know, your omega-3s. And so eventually we decided, well, we have to get rid of trans fats. And that was kind of when I came into and wrote that gourmet article, which was I, it was a kind of a growing understanding in the early 2000s, really, that trans fats were bad for health and we better get rid of them. It's unbelievable the influence that vegetable oils had over North America. You know, everyone had Crisco at home. Everyone was using margarine. This was a way of life. And because people were fearing saturated fats. So, you know, people didn't really know that things like coconut oil and butter that have been now eradicated were actually what should be used. But let's talk about how people can start to embrace, and I know our audience is well-primed on, you know, using things like grass-fed butter and coconut oil, but starting to make that switch to making these more regular fats at home. And I remember listening to something that you talked about how, you know, McDonald's, for example, was using lard at one time, switched to their, you know, the toxic vegetable oils. And really, like, that just goes to show the trend and the impact that had on everybody. But let's go back to how people can start to incorporate the real fats at home and starting to make these more of a staple. People always ask me this question, well, what do I cook with? And that's a key thing because again, when you're adding heat to a fat that speeds up any kind of oxidation reaction, well, you should definitely not be cooking with polyunsaturated vegetable oils. So that includes really almost any oil. The one oil that is not polyunsaturated, does not have multiple double bonds, is olive oil. Olive oil is what's called a monounsaturated fat, which means it has mono for one double bond. And that means it has much less opportunity to react with oxygen. So olive oil is a safer oil. It doesn't oxidize so much. So I use olive oil for salad dressings and any kind of, I still don't heat it or we don't heat it much. Um, I think better for cooking is to use solid fats. And that could be butter, ghee, lard, tallow, if you can get your hands on it. And actually, McDonald's, what they used to fry their french fries in was tallow. Beef fat, there's, you know, there's all kinds of companies now making these products. You can also use, if you want a plant-based oil, you can use coconut oil or coconut butter. Those are both great. It's interesting that for food companies, they've mainly switched to palm oil because that is also saturated, solid, stable, but there really isn't like a consumer product for that. But any of those hard fats are excellent for cooking. Duck fat is good. I mean, all of these are, you know, were used historically. Coconut oil was used for millennia in in tropical countries. And, you know, for people of European, Western European heritage, we always used, again, butter and lard. That's what our, our ancestors used. And that's safe. I think there's a lot of confusion still between the different tropical oils, the palm kernel oil, coconut oil, palm oil, 
Can you describe the difference between these? And then we can dig into if there's any validity behind the uh, scare of especially palm oil. Well, again, so the consumer product is coconut oil. The one that's used commercially, and there's, at least as I understand, I've never seen a consumer product, but there's both palm kernel and palm fruit oil, I think it is. And there are two different parts of the palm plant. And I actually went to Malaysia and, and went to a palm oil plantation. It's like the most incredible fruit you have ever seen. It's like this gigantic thing. You can't even get your arms around with these bright red. They look like rubies is the palm fruit. It's just incredible to behold. But you know, whether they're using the kernel or the fruit is it creates a different kind of oil. And again, so that's mainly been used in manufacturing. And especially since we've gotten rid of oils, hydrogenated oils with trans fats, what is a food company going to do? They can't use those stable vegetable oils because they contain trans fats. They can't go just use a plain old oil because that's still unstable and won't, you know, will go rancid on a shelf. So they've been turning mainly to these palm oils um, that come out of the tropics. Now we're going to take a quick break from the show with Nina to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Raw Elements. Since fat is the topic of conversation today, you guys have to get your hands on Dastiny Nut Butters. The cashew butter, the pumpkin seed butter, the watermelon seed butter, these are all incredible additions to your smoothies, to your morning breakfast. You can just pull out a spoon and spoon them in. They're so good. They are stone ground. They're raw, they're vegan, and they're delicious. So make sure you stock up on a collection of Dastiny Nut Butters. As a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your raw elements purchases. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. And for listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle that order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Again, to take advantage of your listener discount, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. Hit pause, go and take advantage right now. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Sun Warrior. And guys, not all smoothies have to be super thick and creamy. You can make a thinned out smoothie, especially this time of year if you just want something to hydrate. What I love to do is just take a tablespoon or two of the Warrior Blend, the Chocolate Warrior Blend in particular, mix it in with some coconut water and maybe a little bit of coconut butter and some ice and blend that up and have what I like to call a nice iced coconut chocolate latte. Really delicious, really refreshing, and really good, and also high in protein. So get your hands on the Chocolate Warrior Blend. As a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior purchases. Go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And for listeners in the US and Canada, again, if you bundle that order together, spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. Really great products, great deal. Go and take advantage right now by going to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. You can thank us later. And now back to our show with Nina Teichels. So I think this is really timely. I really want to dig into coconut oil specifically because of this article that it's made its way throughout the interwebs and everyone is still emailing us and asking us questions. And you wrote an article in response to this. So let's break down why coconut oil is not the culprit that will, you know, cause ill health and heart disease. Okay, so this is totally interesting from my little cave where I live, (laughs) thinking nothing about fats. But so about a month ago, the American Heart Association comes out with what it calls its presidential advisory. Why the president? I don't know. But um, presidential advisory on saturated fats, where they are reviewing the evidence again on saturated fats, and they say they definitely cause heart disease. They increase it by 30%. You know, if you eat saturated fats over polyunsaturated vegetable oils, or they say if you use vegetable oils instead of saturated fats, you can reduce your risk of heart disease by 30%, as much as a statin, right? Headline grabbing numbers. And they devote a special section of that report to coconut oils. Why? Because I guess they're high in saturated fats. There's nothing particular about coconut oil. They didn't really review the specific literature on coconut oil, right, as a food stuff. They did not review that literature. They went after coconut oil because it's high in saturated fats. Well, on the general topic of saturated fats, the AHA advisory, and I wrote first a very rigorous response to it with a, it was a cardiologist and I who co-authored that for Medscape. Maybe we can get that link to your uh, listeners, but 
it really shows how the AHA review is an outlier, that there's been nine other systematic rigorous reviews of virtually the same evidence, and none of those other nine reviews came to the same conclusion as the American Heart Association. So all of those reviews concluded that saturated fats have no zero effect on cardiovascular mortality or total mortality. And then if you use a kind of weaker composite endpoint, if you look at like heart attacks plus angina, angina is heart pain, but it's like, it's much more um, debatable about whether it exists or doesn't exist. And it's, it's a much more subjective kind of outcome to look at. But if you look at those more subjective outcomes and ignore the more rigorous mortality data, then you can start seeing maybe some kind of effect of saturated fats. But again, it's just far less rigorous data. And the American Heart Association basically ignored the more rigorous mortality data that exists. And that's the only way they came to the conclusion that they did. So this was a piece that we wrote in Medscape. And then I wrote a follow-up piece for a general audience in the Los Angeles Times as an op-ed about a week ago. But why did they single out the coconut oil? So there's really kind of no explanation, right? Okay, it's high in saturated fats, but you could just as easily single out palm oil or you could single out a cut of red meat. You could single out something that else is that is high in saturated fats. Really, my understanding of this is that, and this is something that I, a story that I tell in my book about how in the past, the domestic soybean industry, which by the way, is a major contributor to the American Heart Association, and that's documented in the, both the pieces that I wrote. The American Soybean Association has basically gone after the foreign competition, which is coconut oil, and demonized it by, by going after the saturated fat content. So it's like a trade war wrapped in the guise of a health campaign. You know, the best way I can understand it is that they're just trying to get rid of the foreign competition, which is coconut oil. We don't grow it in the US, it's a threat to our own domestic industry. I think that's basically what's going on there. I mean, there's nothing to show that coconut oil is bad for health. Nothing. And it contains a bunch of antioxidants and, and vitamins that make it probably make it good for health. But, you know, in this case, I think the American Heart Association was doing the bidding of the American Soybean Association, which supports it quite generously. And I want to talk about a high unsaturated fat diet. And in your TEDx talk, you talk about this LA veterans trial where a group of people were eating a high in saturated fat diet. And do you want to talk about what the results of that were and, and set up what that study looked like? So this was the um, a study that was done in the 19, started in the late 1960s. It was done in a veterans hospital in Los Angeles. And so half the men got what was considered a normal diet and saturated fats at that point what was considered normal was about 18% of calories. And they, you know, had regular meat, regular cheese, regular milk. And then the experimental group got a diet that was very high in soybean oil. So um, soy filled cheese, soy filled milk, soy burgers, that kind of thing. It lasted maybe five or six years. At the end of that, they found no difference in cardiovascular mortality, no difference in total mortality, but they did find that the men on the high vegetable oil diet, well, they seemed to suffer fewer heart attacks. That was something that they, they found, but they died at much higher rates of cancer, much higher rates, and they died at higher rates of suicidal and accidental deaths, which was just completely unexplained. But the cancer findings turned up in other trials too. There were like maybe three other trials where the soybean or corn oil eating groups died at higher rates of cancer. This was so disturbing to people at the time in the late 1970s when they were reckoning with this data that they had a series, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, called together a series of high-level expert meetings in the early 1980s to try to understand this so-called side effect of cancer. And they just could never figure it out. And then they just decided, well, we'll just ignore it because we believe this diet is good for cardiovascular health. And I guess, you know, if it causes cancer, <laughs> well, then so be it. That was where it was left in the late 1980s. And, and nobody has ever resolved it since. Let's talk about a really popular unsaturated fat. And you touched on this earlier, saying that you're using olive oil when you're not cooking with it. But let's talk about that tied into the Mediterranean diet. And this diet within the health world over the last number of years has just been looked at as a really healthy way to eat. What are your thoughts on that? <sighs> well, I wrote a whole chapter on this in my book. And 
it was a really eye-opening chapter to investigate because what I found was so surprising to me, which is that the Mediterranean diet was really the brainchild of the European olive oil industry. They wanted to open up U.S. markets to olive oil, and they figured out the way to do this was to promote something called the Mediterranean diet. And how to do that? Well, they, in coordination with a U.S.-based group, kind of food group called Old Ways in Boston, they launched this incredible series of conferences all over the Mediterranean, the beautiful sun-kissed Mediterranean in Greece and Italy and Tunisia. They had these fantastic food conferences to which they invited, you know, leading scientists, mainly, you know, a lot from Harvard who became completely enamored with this idea and food writers and chefs. I talked to dozens of people who attended these conferences. They all said they were the the greatest ever conferences ever to exist. And it was all funded by the European Olive Oil Council and some affiliated industries, you know, some fruits and vegetables companies, uh, industries. And so that was how the Mediterranean diet was born. Harvard came out with their version of the Mediterranean diet and um, promoted it. And so Harvard came out with their version of it in the early 1990s. Like Until maybe 2012, there was never a randomized controlled clinical trial on the, on the Mediterranean diet. So it was all based you know, on this kind of weak associational data. It really didn't have any basis in good, sound science. And then, so to date, there's been one trial on the so-called Mediterranean diet, but really the problems that have plagued it from the start have been, you know, how do you define the Mediterranean diet? They tried to kind of create these scales like, oh, you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Well, what's a lot? You have a lot of oil, olive oil. Well, what's a lot of that? And, you know, and the diet totally varies from Southern France to Southern Italy to Greece, you know, and it's always been this incredibly vague concept although super popular, but really still just based on one clinical trial on only on diabetics, never on a normal population. So we really just, we don't know what the Mediterranean diet is and we don't know if it's healthy for everybody. And food and food traditions are are so much a part of one's culture, right? So, you know, maybe what bugs me about the Mediterranean diet is that like, it suggests like we should all be Mediterranean. Why should we tell the Brazilians to eat like the Mediterraneans? Why should I tell somebody from Sweden with their grandmother's recipes and their food tradition? Why should that person have to be Mediterranean? You know, the only reason we know so much about the Mediterranean is that everybody wanted to go to conferences there. Well, I mean, the Siberian diet might be great, but nobody wants to go to conferences there. You know, I just think it's a mistake to tell everybody that you have to be Mediterranean, especially when the data is so very weak. There's really no basis that the whole world should become Mediterranean. That's such a valid point. You know, where we live and the foods that we have access to really are at the basis of our health. And I think people really need to be more mindful of what's in season, what's available, and eat those foods. But I'm sure just like with, you know, anything and and different studies that are done and showing olive oil we know is a healthy incorporation into our diet and it can benefit us in certain ways, but it may not be the full picture. But something that you you know brought up in terms of some of the findings with this study in terms as it relates to cholesterol and you know lowering the wrong kinds and raising the right kinds, you know this can lead into people really getting confused as to what they're looking for when it comes to cholesterol levels. And I really want to get into this because this is an ongoing topic that people are still fearing what that means when they come back from the doctor, get those levels. What are we looking for? Let's really break down cholesterol, talk about why it's so important to us and what are the healthy levels that we need to be looking for? Well, that's really a a good topic because, you know, the reason that we started avoiding saturated fat and cholesterol back in the day of Ansel Keys was that it was thought that it raised your total cholesterol. I mean, that was all they could measure back then. And then that total cholesterol would cause a heart attack. When they finally studied that for decades, they found that total cholesterol was actually very weakly tied to heart disease risk. People with high cholesterol turned out to be just as likely to, you know, be healthy as people with low cholesterol. I mean, it just was not a reliable predictor of your actual risk. So then the whole conversation shifted to LDL cholesterol, your low density lipoprotein cholesterol many, many studies. So it turns out, you know, if you lower your LDL cholesterol using drugs like statins, that seems to have some benefit. 
They've done a number of clinical trials showing that when people lower use their diet to lower their LDL, that means going on a low-fat diet, basically that lowers your LDL. Those trials have never been able to show that lowering your LDL cholesterol improves your heart attack risk. So LDL turns out to be a lot less relevant. And what best predicts your heart attack risk turns out to be your HDL cholesterol, which you're supposed to be supposedly good cholesterol. You want to raise that high and you want to keep your triglycerides, which is a reflection of the fatty acids in your blood. You want to keep those low. And those turn out to be your HDL to triglyceride ratio turns out to be the very best predictor of your heart attack risk. Those are achieved when you go on a diet that lowers carbohydrates and increases fat. And what is increasingly, there's a really a growing and interesting body of literature that really suggests that what best predicts your likelihood to have any kind of metabolic disease, what do I mean by that? Metabolic diseases are ones that are caused by your, your metabolism is becoming dysfunctional, and that is the root cause. You know, Some people call it syndrome X or metabolic disease. That is the root cause of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, even cancer, that all those chronic diseases, the so-called diseases of civilization that really did not exist, you know, 300 years ago and have now become epidemic. They are the result of this metabolic dysfunctions that happens in people. And that happens when the best predictors of that are your degree of insulin resistance which is something we can talk about, but basically your ability to deal with carbohydrates, you, you start to become intolerant of carbohydrates. And it's also reflected in high triglycerides, that's bad, a lot of fatty acids in your blood, and low HDL cholesterol. Those are all signs that you're getting this metabolic dysfunction. No, this is great because I really want to go into that, you know, basically your book, you know, butter, meat, and, and cheese are are what is helping the body actually protect itself to ward off some of these diseases. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about your studies and your findings and how that we need to maybe look at things differently and look at meats and cheese in a very different light that these can actually help protect us from diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and whatnot. Really the way into this discussion is to discuss first carbohydrates. Because what the clinical trial literature shows, and I'm talking like nearly 100 clinical trials, including some that have lasted two years long, which is enough to show any side effects and, you know, on altogether thousands and thousands of people. What that large body of rigorous evidence shows is that reducing carbohydrates starts to reverse obesity, diabetes, heart disease. So it's really carbohydrates that are total carbohydrates that are the bad actors. And I know we talk a lot about, you know, sugars and refined carbohydrates. Those are probably worse, but the reality is like once you are obese or diabetic or have one of these conditions, you have to reduce your total carbohydrates. That's like even you have to reduce. For some people they can just get away with they're like, "Okay, no more desserts. That's it. I'm healthy now." And that actually happens for some people. Other people have to cut out bread and potatoes and rice, and other people have to go really low and cut out, you know, quinoa and whole grain oatmeal and really bring carbohydrates down. So when you bring carbohydrates down, there's only three kinds of macronutrients you can eat. There's fat, protein, and carbohydrates. If carbohydrates are coming down, what do you increase? Well, protein really has to stay more or less constant because too much protein also induces an insulin response. So what you're really increasing is your fats. That's where the, you know, the idea of what kind of fats do you increase? Like, do you start drinking bowlfuls of soybean oil or corn oil? Probably not. <laughs> like, I don't know how that tastes, but it doesn't seem very good to me. What you start increasing are animal foods, right? More meat, more full fat dairy, not low fat dairy, cottage cheese, more cheese, more eggs, all those foods, more coconut oil, you cook with more liberal amounts of stuff, you use more butter. I mean, all of that is where you start to increase your fats. So you end up with a diet that is higher in fat and lower in carbohydrates. And that is consistently the diet that is shown to best control your blood glucose, which is the critical thing for people with diabetes, best reduces weight, you are able to control diabetes and improves most cardiovascular risk factors. So I'm talking about increases your HDL. In fact, the only thing that it, the only food that increases HDL is saturated fats. And that's your good cholesterol going up. Reduces your triglycerides. It tends to, you know, induce your all the other things, CRP protein. I mean, there's 
Sometimes it, it causes a transient rise in your LDL bad cholesterol, but that's usually something that stabilizes over time. So really that is the, the healthiest diet. It's pretty much the only diet that you should be on if you have one of these metabolic diseases. We're going to take another quick break from the show with Nina to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Thrive Market. If you live in the USA and you have a computer, then you're perfectly eligible to start ordering online at Thrive Market. I don't know why you wouldn't take advantage of the incredible deal that's offered through Thrive Market, and that is all of their products are 20 to 50% off of regular retail prices. This is such an amazing deal, guys. And you get the choice to choose all of your favorite health food products, home products, supplements. It's all there. And you can choose by category, vegan, gluten-free, paleo, grain-free, anything that your heart desires, it's all there. And Thrive Market is all about giving back. So every membership that is purchased, they give another membership to a family in need, making healthy eating accessible and affordable. So in addition to the 20 to 50% off that you get at Thrive Market, you're also going to get 25% off as a listener of our show, plus free shipping, plus a 30-day free trial. All of that at Thrive Market. To take advantage of this incredible deal, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. These products are amazing. The deal is incredible. Hit pause. Go and take advantage right now. So now I'm going to read a review from the week from Itola from Canada. This is a five-star review called Excellent Podcast. Very approachable and easy to understand podcast about health. They keep it entertaining with well-renowned guests. Whether you're a beginner at improving your health or you're a professional, you'll learn something new every time. Plus, they are very close to their listeners and always answer quickly when you write them a message. Good job. Well, thank you so much for this awesome review. And guys, if you haven't had a chance to leave us a review yet, go ahead and do so. UltimateHealthPodcast.com slash iTunes. We really appreciate everybody that takes the time to leave a review. If you haven't done so already, please take a minute. Do it right now. Marnie and I read each and every one, even if we don't get a chance to read it aloud on the show. We thank you guys ahead of time. And now back to our show with Nina. Nina, I think an important thing that we should just quickly touch on too is that your diet has actually evolved quite a bit over the years. You spent 20 years as a vegetarian, so you've seen the full spectrum and and you've come to this conclusion as somebody who's actually experienced different ways of eating. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about what your diet looked like back when you're eating vegetarian. Yeah, I mean, I always forget to say this because like, I truly came to this from a totally different point of view. I mean, when I was in my late teens, I just like, I was like, okay, I'm going to stop eating red meat, stop eating butter, no cream, no cheese, and... So I went on a, not a strict vegetarian diet, but pretty strict. And I ate a lot more pasta and grains. And so I promptly became fat. That was one thing that happened. (laughs) But I was totally convinced it was my fault. So I, you know, exercised more and started running six miles a day and biking. And and I was still fat. I was was fat really as not fat, fat, but, you know, 30 pounds heavier than I am now as a young woman, which is not fun. I pretty much stayed that way, totally convinced that that diet was right until kind of my mid to late 30s when I started researching my book. And I also happened to inherit this job as a restaurant reviewer for this little throwaway paper where we couldn't afford to um, pay for the restaurants for the meals. So we just had to eat whatever they sent out to us. And what do they send out? Chefs are not sending out, you know, stir fried vegetables, which is what I would normally order. Instead, they were sending out, you know, especially like French chefs. What are they proud of? They're proud of their red meats and cream sauces and all this stuff. And so I started eating these foods that had been for decades really sort of forbidden to me. And I found that they were incredibly textured and earthy and delicious that I guess I had been sort of craving them. And also I lost weight mysteriously. Like I just couldn't believe that somehow, and all my cardiovascular risk factors improved. Like I went to the doctor, I said, I'm sure I'm killing myself. And he said, no, you look better. And that gradually over time, you know, as I did the research for my book, I realized, wow, I've just gotten it totally backwards. I'm just not eating healthfully. And then, and I started to add meat into my diet and it took me a long time though. You know, I'm not one of these like overnight converted people. The first time I bought a piece of red meat, I just thought I was going to be sick to my stomach. (laughs) 
you know, it took me a long time. Then I discovered, wow, how much easier is it to grill a piece of steak than it is to spend what I did, you know, hours chopping and dicing and roasting and steaming peppers and all these vegetarian meals that I had been surviving on for so long. So, so eventually my diet really changed. Um, I still love vegetables, but you know, I now have plenty of meat. I'm not afraid of it. You know, I eat those foods without guilt. I don't eat any low fat food. I love cheese and, and I don't feel guilty about it. So whole foods, just really like you're all about just, you know, getting the quality meat and the animal protein. But in terms of your fruits and vegetable intake, you know, what are you going to? Like, what does your fruit, you know, intake for the day look like? And what kinds of veggies are you putting on your plate with meat or cheese? Well, I try to use, you know, eat non-starchy vegetables, again, to try to keep carbohydrates low. So mushrooms, asparagus, all kinds of greens and herbs. I love all those foods. and fruit is full of sugar, right? And fruit has been bred to be much more sugary than it was in the past. You know, I'm sure if we all traveled back in time and tried a strawberry circa 1700, we would spit it out because it would seem so bitter to us. But I think of fruit as like a dessert. I don't really think of it as I did for so long, like as, oh, if I'll just survive on fruit all afternoon and that'll be good for me. But I no longer think that, you know, I really treat it like a dessert now. I really juicy, luscious, beautiful peach. I know it's full of sugar, but it's fine if that's a dessert and not a a meal. And again, you probably also know your body and how you respond to these foods and you're honoring what works for you. That's right. I mean, we're all different. And this is one of the things that, you know, there is no one size fits all diet. Like everybody's able to tolerate fruits and sugars and carbohydrates at a different level, right? If I had my old teenage body back, I would be eating differently. But, you know, now I'm a middle-aged woman. So I have, you know, I I have to be more realistic about what I can eat. The reality is that like thin, healthy people can eat differently than people who are, you know, older or their metabolism has shifted or we have to realize like, how you can eat as a healthy person is different than how you can eat as somebody whose you know metabolism is a little bit less robust. And I, I accept that. So I'm fine with that. But I know that like I don't tell my kids to eat exactly as I do. I mean, I try to keep them away from sugar, but you know, if they want to eat a lot of fruit, I they burn it off. Their bodies can handle it. So I'm not going to make them into social outcasts. Let's talk about that for a second. You know, women and children do need fat. And I know, you know, some women who are caught up on the low fat trend still to this day, not only are doing this to themselves, but also inadvertently giving their kids a very low fat diet. So let's talk about the importance of making sure that we're, you know, that children are getting good quality essential fats from a young age. You know, one of the interesting studies that I came across, there's a section of my book on women and children, just, you know, first of all, talking about the fact that we are all slavishly following these official recommendations about diet that were totally all based on evidence on middle-aged men, right? Nothing on women and children. Like we were just taken along for the ride. When I was writing that part of my book, I felt, you know, risibly angry. Like, how could you do that to women and children? But it was just that, you know, who does the science, who funds the science? It's all middle-aged men. The data that I could find on children really showed that children do better on a higher fat diet. And, you know, who were the children who were the healthiest with the, you know, growing the fastest, looking the best and the most healthy? Well, the children on low fat diets who are basically in countries like Africa, maybe the US, but, you know, they really suffered at much higher rates of what's called growth faltering. That means they're unable to grow well. The children who grew the best, you know, and are the children eating a lot of milk and meat and just kind of traditional animal foods. And, you know, I don't know if you've been to Europe lately, but if you go to Germany or any of the Nordic countries where they have not really switched to lower fat diets, you can go to, I was in Germany this summer, every single restaurant has got sausages in it. That's just their standard fare. Well, they're like a foot taller than us. <laughs> They've like continued to grow taller and taller. And whereas the average American height stagnated pretty much the year the dietary guidelines, the low fat dietary guidelines were put into place. That's when Americans started faltering on their height. You know, the truth is healthy growth, at least the best evidence that we can find, really healthy, robust growth really requires a higher fat diet and these foods that we have shunned. But, you know, that's where all the nutrients are. 
The bioavailable nutrients that we need for healthy growth are in meat and dairy and eggs. You know, they're not as available from plant food. You know, to get the amount of iron that you need out of spinach, you need a room full of spinach compared to, you know, four ounces of beef. You know, unfortunately, and I'm guilty of this, you know, I was a mother who brought my first child up on only fruits and vegetables. And that child now has a lot of health difficulties. And my second child I brought up, you know, after I had started researching my book, you know, that child has been brought up on whole fat milk and grass fed meat and all of that. And boy, I mean, you know, it's just, those are, it's not science. It's just my own observation, but it's made a huge difference. Nina, we can't let you go without talking about the new documentary, What the Health. It's now in Netflix. And I know everywhere Marnie and I go, people ask us about it and are talking about it. And this movie obviously is putting out the vegan diet as the best way to eat and the healthiest way to eat. So we uh, came across your piece that you wrote on dietdoctor.com, which was a review of your thoughts on this. So I'd just love for you to share for a couple minutes what were some of your initial reactions when you saw this film? Well, what was your reaction to it? I'm curious to know. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I am a former vegetarian as well. So, you know, I recently just made the switch over the last couple of years. And I turned and said to Jesse, I said, even if I was still vegetarian, I would disagree with so many points brought up in this film. And, you know, I just couldn't believe some of the research they're, you know, bringing forth. And I you know, certainly don't know the research as well as you do. But I just know certain claims that were being made were so far fetched. And I can see how influential it was. Like if I was on the fence right now and not really sure of where I want to go and how I want to eat, I would be afraid to eat meat for sure. So I can see the effect on this. But someone like yourself who really knows the science and has done the work, we'd love to hear your perspective. Well, thanks. But I, you know, I have to say like I had the same reaction and this is what I wrote about in my piece, which is like, oh my gosh, if I did not know what I know, I would be a vegan tomorrow. Like how terrifying is that film? You feel like, okay, eggs is like eating eggs is like smoking five cigarettes a day. And I mean, it's just like every possible claim, health claim and the environmental claims. Like you just feel like it's the worst possible thing to eat those foods. What I did was because I think I am kind of compulsive. That's what took me so much time to write my book. Like I was like, okay, I have to look at every single health claim that this film makes. And I went through every single one of them and I looked at the studies that they relied upon what I found was that, you know, 96% of the claims are based on weak to non-existent data. Like in many cases, the study that they cite says the opposite of what they claim. Like animal foods cause autism and SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Okay, so that's alarming, right? So I went and looked at that study. What does that study say? It's a report by the European Commission and it says there is insufficient data to say anything about I think it was caseins, actually. Caseins from cheese cause autism and SIDS. So they're citing something. It looks official, looks like it's right, but it's not support at all for what they're saying. It's like a kind of lie, really. And the majority of the studies that they cite are what's called ep from epidemiological data. That's the kind of data that can show associations, but not causation. And it's just a notoriously unreliable kind of data. It's not supposed to be used for proving things. It's supposed to be used to kind of suggest hypotheses that then rigorous scientists go out and test. It just shows an association. Like you can get anything associated with anything else. Like, do you know that organic food is associated with higher rates of heart disease? There are all kinds of associations. Internet use is associated with breast cancer. That doesn't mean it causes it. It just means that they happen to be associated with each other. So that kind of science is really unreliable when it's actually been tested in more rigorous clinical trials, like the actual kind of science that can show cause and effect, that kind of science is shown to be right like zero to 20% of the time. So that is to say it's 80 to 100% of the time wrong. And that's the majority of the kind of science that they cite. The other kinds of stuff they cite are posts by animal welfare activists. Well, they have an animal welfare agenda, which I you know totally sympathize with, but it's not about science of health. It's about a different agenda. So I think it's lamentable, that film, and that it's it's really a piece of propaganda. It's not really an effort to be honest about the science, in my view. Yeah, well, thank you for your perspective on that. And Nina, what we're going to do, we're coming up on time, but we want to ask you a handful of questions, just fun questions to get to know you a little bit better. 
That's fine. I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Shoot. First one. What do you wish you had more time for? Exercise. If you could go back and tell your 20-year-old self a piece of advice, what would it be? Easy. Eat more fat. (laughs) Nice. The obvious one. (laughs) What are uh, three things you're grateful for right now? The view out my window on a beautiful meadow, and I'm not in hot, sweaty New York City where I live uh, normally. Uh, The fact that both my sons are not at this very moment unhappy at their camps, which is every parent lives in fear of their child being unhappy. I'm incredibly grateful for the fact that I've had a chance to make a contribution to this field. Like I spent most of my life feeling like I wasn't doing anything meaningful or important. And now I feel like I am in a small way contributing. You absolutely are. So Nina, what is a book other than your book that you love? A favorite health book? Wow. Uh, Well, you know, I think I have to cite Gary Taubes' books, which just because I think they're so important. And I think he's just, I really think he's the godfather of this whole field. So Good calories, bad calories, not the easiest read, but I just think it's an incredibly important contribution to the field. So we've talked a lot about food. What is your specialty in the kitchen? <laughs> so when I said that I, it's easier to grill a steak than to do anything else, that's what I do. I've learned how to grill steaks. That's my favorite thing to do. Okay, Nina, in wrapping up, what is one takeaway from all this awesome conversation that we've had today that our listeners can be left with to help them reach ultimate health? I think don't fear the fat. Do not fear eating fat. The fat you eat is not the fat you get. And do not fear saturated fats in foods. I mean, that's the most important takeaway. So Nina, we definitely recommend our listeners get a copy of your book, The Big Fat Surprise. But how else can they go and connect with you after the show? So I've just launched a new website called just my name, ninateichels.com. And since you probably can't find that, you can go to the bigfatsurprise.com and that will reroute you to my new website. And And I'm also on Twitter. That's where I'm probably most active as Big Fat Surprise. I'm on um, Facebook as well. Awesome. And we're going to link up all your amazing articles over on our show notes at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. And Nina, thank you so much for such a great conversation. Thank you. It's really a delightful uh, thing to talk to you both. And I thank you for having me on. Yeah, Nina, this has been great. Take care. You too. I hope you guys love this episode. We would love to know what you guys thought of today's episode. So make sure you are in our group, ultimatehealthpodcast.com forward slash community. Share with us your thoughts on today's show. Also, I hope you guys loved our first Focus Friday. So we're going to be doing these now weekly on Fridays, short, sweet, to the point, little mini episodes, lots of good information. Excited for you guys to listen. And I just want to give a shout out to Jason Sanderson, our engineer and editor at podcasttech.com. He does such a great job with the episodes. Have a great week, you guys. We will talk soon. Take care.